On this episode of Still Loading, the world of working designs. Copyright forever loading. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval, and today on the show, I have a new guest, uh, a guest that I have interacted with a little bit on Twitter, and I love his videos on YouTube. His name is Mike, and he is from the Forever Loading YouTube channel. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Doing fantastic. Uh, Like I was telling you off, Mike, a little tired. My daughter woke me up early, but other than that, I'm doing very well. (laughs) Um, I have you on today, though, because you are one of the few people that I know who gives a shit about working designs. (laughs) Uh, Working designs for people who, for anyone who does not know, was a local, was a publisher, was a game publisher in the U.S. They didn't do any development work, right? It was just publishing. No, they only did uh, localization and publishing that's what I thought. I thought it was just localization and publishing. So the reason why this company is kind of important, and I've heard that their their founder or the CEO Victor Ireland has is a polarizing figure. Is that true? Um, a little bit. He's been known to be a little picky with things he's worked with, the people he's worked with, and some of the design changes he's made over games uh, over the times haven't aged well. But I think a lot of things he's done made sense in context with the time they were done. Okay, we'll we'll get into that then. Yeah. We'll get into that then. So, what Working Designs is, well, was is a co- they were a company that would publish games that were only released in Japan, and they would bring them over to the U.S. and they would localize them. And they were one of the first companies to really put a lot of care and effort into localizing games from Japan over here in the U.S. And because you could see a lot of times localization was really half-assed. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's why you have games like especially i i did um an episode a while ago like a long while ago called still loading story time Mm -hmm. where we did dramatic readings of old video game manuals and all the characters names are like john and steve and frank and it's just because the localization team's like well this is american sounding so we're just going to do it that way uh instead of really trying to do a nice blend like a mixture of the japanese culture and the japanese side of the game design with american tastes trying to appeal to an american audience and working designs really gave it they they really tried their best and you know like you were saying before some of the decisions were questionable uh in retrospect not just because a lot there's a lot of really creative liberties taken with some of from my understanding like they change mm-hmm. complete songs am i right in some of them in some of the games well they 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 took an approach that was more about the feeling and the intention rather than the literal um definitions a lot of the time okay which is like if you a lot of things especially with music like when the lunar series for example transfer translating things literally doesn't always come across especially from a language like japanese to english mm-hmm. it's all the whole thing with subs versus dubs today in anime in general is like how literal do you approach this? And I think they took the more figurative approach, which I think makes a lot of sense, um, especially for the time. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I, I've talked about it a bit before on the podcast. There's a big difference between tra- just translating a game and localizing a game. Mm-hmm. Translating a game, like you said, it doesn't always add up. Like how many times have you seen like machine translated manga or something like that? where it's just the most gibberish sentence in the world. And you understand it, but it's very broken uh, because you can't just directly translate. And even if you do translate it well and you, you know, rearrange for grammatically for English, it's still, it's, it's very different than what, than if you just localize it Uh, and localization for those who don't know is when you actually, like you were saying, you kind of, Look at the intent of something and you make it work more for the English, for the American audience or for whichever country that it's being localized to. And you kind of change it around while keeping the true intention of what it originally said there, the spirit of it, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. And working designs did a lot of that. But before we talk about working designs, let's talk. Let me ask you a couple questions, Mike. So I, I mentioned before I wanted to 
the viewers, uh, viewers, listeners to get to know you. Uh, so what are you're, you're big into Sega and to working design. You're doing a whole video series, the world of working designs, hence the little tag at the beginning. So let's hear a little bit about you. What are some of your favorite types of games? What games do you enjoy playing? And what was your first console? Um, I like all sorts of games. I like RPGs and platformers and action games. I'm not big on uh, shooters just because I'm terrible at them. Uh, <laughs> especially no, first person shooters. shooters. Okay. okay. Um, scrolling shooters FPS. I'm a little better at, but I just the twitch reflexes just kill me sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. My first console was the N64, but my first platform was the Game Gear. Oh, a couple really? years earlier. Oh, yeah. man, Sega from the beginning then. Yeah, but I've always bounced around. I went from uh, Game Gear to Game Boy Color to N64 to PS2 to all over the place. And then I went back when I was in high school because I asked for the Wii for Christmas and no one could get the Wii when it came out. Mm-hmm. So I asked for a Dreamcast as backup and then I got a Saturn right after that and I just went back and forth between retro and so, current. So while the Wii and the 360 and the PS3 out, you were playing on the Saturn <laughs> and the Dreamcast. Yeah. A couple generations. Well, once uh, Saturn, sorry, Dreamcast was only two generations prior at that mm-hmm. point. And then the Saturn was three. That's crazy. Now, so, that I mean, hopefully Saturn games weren't that expensive back then. They pro- they're they definitely now. They were more expensive than the Dreamcast ones for sure, but they've skyrocketed since the mid-2000s, yeah. That's why I have I have a Saturn and I have... I think three games for it. Uh, <laughs> I have missed. I have a demo of of Knights, mm-hmm. and then I have one of the some two Daytona games. Or no, sorry, Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing. I think. Okay, some of those are good. Uh, I don't. I mean, they're expensive. There's ex- they especially are, yeah. like the Saturn was an RPG machine, so there was a there's a lot of good stuff on there, but well, it's expensive. Especially in Japan, a lot of the best stuff for the Saturn got locked in Japan for stupid reasons and complicated business reasons at the same time. So to tie this into working designs, so that, that that's a perfect transition kind of because working designs would localize games that wouldn't have gotten a chance over here in the States. Am I right? Like that was pretty much their that was pretty much their philosophy. Am I right? Yeah, they went over a lot of niche properties and genres that uh, had devoted fan bases and kind of hungry fan bases, but weren't really being met in the West. Yeah, I mean, if you look at their they're at least according to wikipedia and i feel like there's probably some missing on wikipedia but if you look at their the games that they publish uh you know lunar was an rpg that probably rpgs were so hit or miss back in the Mm -hmm. early 90s not like not until final seven did rpgs really jrpgs specifically really hit any type of like major popularity in the states so the fact that they were willing to publish like the lunar games on uh on and probably i don't know how expensive it was but they really did a good job with the packaging on that at least because i i have the first one mm-hmm. but then they also did uh kadash was one of their earliest ones too right yeah they did kadash um their first games were for the turbo graphics because victor ireland the guy who basically was the head of working designs for its run was a big fan of the ser- uh, the system in japan and realized that it's kind of getting the short end of the stick here and he did Paris All Stars and Kadash first within a short range of each other, then Cosmic Fantasy 2, which was their first RPG. And then they gradually made their way to Sega CD and other platforms from there. And what's crazy to me about working designs is that they, so we know them now for their, like, all this crazy localization stuff, but they started as a company that was meant to create uh, marketing accounting software for IBMs for, like, various companies. And then the co one of the co-founders, Todd Mark, I mean, I shouldn't make fun of him, but like he's got two first names, which is confusing. <laughs> uh, he died unexpectedly. Do you know do you know how he died? Is that is that like yeah, I, record, I like, did some digging in old forums because Vic Ireland is actually really or was really vocal on his own message board and other forums. He communicated really well, which is makes my job easier making these videos. <laughs> <That's> um, <funny. laughs> But he said um, the doctor gave him a bad mix of prescriptions that he was allergic to, and he killed him. He died from a bad mix of prescriptions. Oh, that sucks. And um, then Victor Ireland was brought on board to finish the work. And over time, he, as he was finishing that work, he convinced his boss, the the founder of the company, to switch to software. Sylvia Schmidt. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Sylvia Schmidt from what I'm from what I'm reading here. That's so interesting because it's that's such a one it feels like such a 180 transition to go from yeah, it really freaking does. marketing accounting software to be like, let's do JRPGs now. Not immediately, but you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, I know like, you mean. It's just it's so strange. It, so yeah, and they 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 are, their first ever publishing agreement was with Taito specifically, and that's where they got Paris All Stars and Kadash was Taito as well, right? Yeah, it was. Okay, okay. So that that's pretty much where Working Designs got their start then, and from there they just released a ton of games. So what are some of the ones that like stick out to you, man? Like what are some of your uh, right? Because I think your the next episode in your in your series is going to be on Cosmic Fantasy too, right? Yeah, I'm about two thirds of the way through my current playthrough of it. I've never beaten it before. I think um, I have a Turbo Graphics Duo system, and the memory died or something before I could finish it the first Oof. time. And I'm playing through it now, which is just kind of sucks replaying the same part of a grindy game. But uh, mm-hmm. it's it's an interesting relic for the period. But I think my favorite games for them are probably um, the Lunar games. Everybody likes the Lunar games that they've, they've played them pretty much. I think they're pretty popular. And um, I like Magic Knight Rare from the Saturn. And I like, um, I don't know, Growlins or for the PS2 is actually pretty fun, too. Okay, and th- so th- and that's where pretty much was that their last um, was that their last release because PlayStation Two is where they pretty much the last console they did any publishing for because they they unfortunately went bankrupt or they just shut down I guess. Yeah, they had. Um, I don't want to get too ahead of myself if we're going to talk about it, but uh, they had some issues getting things cleared through Sony at the time, and mm-hmm. um, they were basically forced to bundle two games together to release them at all, which cut their profits in like half. And they couldn't really recover from that at the time. That's insane. That sucks. I mean, because I mean, we can we can get into it then, because the the whole th- the whole beef that it comes down with was that uh, who who did they? There was a guy who worked at Sony who came to Sega, I believe, right? And so that's why they left Sega. What was his? Do you remember his name? Uh, Bernie Stoller, I think. That's is who what you're talking is. about. Yeah. Uh, that's a different feel to burn. Uh, they felt the burn in a different way. On that. Yeah, he um, had very strict opinions on software and the Saturn. He hated the idea of the Saturn being launched as it was. And the Saturn had a complicated history and a complicated architecture. And he knew that it wasn't going to be an easy climb. So he wanted to kind of bury it and move on to the Dreamcast quickly. And that kind of irked Victor Ireland and working designs the wrong way because they were really up for supporting it. And also, Mm -hmm. he was very against RPGs in general, thought they weren't going to sell well, they weren't popular, they weren't worth it in the North American market, which time will tell after Final Fantasy VII and other games that it really wasn't the case. They just had to wait a little bit. And they weren't really treated well at the time, except for companies like Working Designs. So they had a lot of bad blood, and they they switched from Sega to Sony in that time after Stolar switched sides from Sega to Sony, or Sony to Sega. And then... The, when they got to Sony, did he come back to Sony? Is that why the they weren't they had to bundle stuff up with the PS2? No, I think I think he was. I forget which way he flip flopped, but uh, there was some other people. They didn't want to focus on two D games at Sony at the time because mm. they were it was such a three D powerhouse for the early two thousands. The PS2 compared to the Dreamcast yep. and other systems. So they grow Lancer as a 2D game, but it's got beautiful art and it's got beautiful sprites. And um, their their uh, argument at the time was, look, you're publishing games like Cat in the Hat for the PS2 and it looks like garbage. And this but is a beautiful 3D. game that's rendered well. Why are you denying us based on looks? And they had to make a bunch of compromises and it led to that package being compromised. That really sucks. So, you know what's something I've always I, they've talked about it on Retronauts a little bit too, but it it really is a crime that during the '90s, like late '90s and early 2000s, just anything 2D was just the death. It was just death to the industry. Like they refused to promote anything, like on on main home consoles, I should say that was that wasn't full 3D or something like that. And it's it's a real shame. Like that that there. Like imagine what they could have done on the Saturn because the Saturn was meant for 2D game design, like 30 oh, bit, yeah. 32 bit yeah. to, uh, 2D game design. They just kind of jerry rigged it so that way they could get 3D to work from my understanding. Right. Well, th- there's like some debate on how 
much it was oriented for 3D from the start, but basically how it was implemented was really backwards and kind of controversial because like uh, the way polygons typically work is they use triangles as their base and that's how most of it works. And the Saturn used quadrilaterals, which is like a whole different way of structuring polygons and <laughs> had its own way with textures and layers and engines. And it was really a mess. But um, the, th- the thing is in, in Japan, 2D games are still flourishing pretty well. And if you look at the, the Saturn's library in Japan, um, and the PlayStation, there's a lot of really nice looking 2D games that just never left the area. Mm-hmm. Like um, if you look at Princess Crown is a favorite example of mine for the Saturn. It's by the I'll look people that up right now uh, who did uh, Odin Sphere. If you know that game. And uh, I do not actually. I think I might have heard of it. It's a vanilla wear. They did, uh, I guess, Rim or what's it called? Um, they've done some recent games, but it's a really beautiful 2D game. And it's never made the light of day out of Japan because it was a 2D game. I'm looking at screenshots now, though. It's all blurry because it's like the pictures. <laughs> that old. Are being just, but these, well, no, it's just because of the bad bad quality pictures. But like oh. now that I'm looking at a GIF of it right now, and this is nuts that this is for sat, like a like a game from the 90s because that animate, I'm looking at a, a, per, a knight in like a purple dress, to like a mm-hmm. young girl, and then a big dude who's wearing kind of like gray and yellow, uh, like dark gray, dark yellow. And he got a mustache and they're just beating the shit. Well, she's beating the shit out of him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know that part of the game. And it's just this animation is beautiful. And the, and the 2d art is stunning. Like it looks like legit anime characters, which you couldn't get at the time. Oh yeah. Well, so, you didn't it, see it, in the U S much. And that's one of the things that working designs, a lot of their games weren't full 3d. They'd have like 2d characters on a 3d background or vice versa. Or, and they never really shied away from 2d, which didn't always sell well and also didn't sit well with the, head publishers at Sony and stuff. I mean, I feel like it doesn't make any sense to me why they wouldn't like, cause if working designs has to pay the upfront costs, like why are they giving like how much money would Sony really stand to lose by working design publishing? Like, do they, how much do they act? Do you know how much they would actually invest for that? I feel like that. I feel like the onus would have been on working design. So why would they have given a shit? I don't really understand the finer details of it myself, but, um, from what I understand, they had like an informal agreement of how they could publish those two games, specifically the Growlancer games. Mm. And um, I think Ark the Lad for PS1, they did a, tr- a four game pack and one game bundle. It's really a lot of work. So they, they were they kind of didn't have like a strict contract for how they were going to do it. And that kind of screwed them in the end as well. Now, do you know, is there, like, we're, we'll get back to working designs in one quick second, but do you know, is there any way to really emulate? I don't think there's good emulators for Saturn, is there? Or are there, there are some now, but they're also really kind of hardware intensive. The Mednefen emulator, mm-hmm. and you can use it in RetroArch and other things too, but um, it's a little tricky to get working, but it emulates pretty well from a lot of games. Not all games, of course, but uh, like um, some extensive games, like I was playing Burning Rangers with it actually when I was streaming last. And that's a pretty okay. intensive Saturn game. It's a really heavy um, 3D f- engine game. So uh, they can do it. It's just hard to get working. And up until very recently, it was very hard to get working in general at all. I'm hoping that eventually the Mr. Project could figure out a core for it. So that way it makes like hardware emulation a lot easier than trying to do like software emulation. That would be nice. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. But okay, so let's kind of like um, go back to, I, I wish they would actually, so they have this in alphabetical order, the list that I see. I need to find a full list of working designed games that's not alphabetical. I have a spreadsheet I made of my collection I could probably send you or something. Oh link. yeah, go for it. Do that. Because I have it listed in um, order with some notes on it that I put from, together for myself. So I'm looking at your list now. Is this all the games that they published, these 30? Yeah, they did one or, one or two games for other companies in the Turbo Graphics era, but I'm not sure exactly what they were. They okay, were kind of okay. contracted out, but I don't, I don't, people don't generally count those as their games. So, yeah, like you said, they did Paris All Stars first and Kadash, and then Cosmic Fantasy 2 was their first RPG, and then Exile. For, are all the Turbo CD and Turbo Graphics games super expensive now? Um, most of them are pretty expensive now, I guess. Uh, Cosmic Fantasy 2 was probably their best selling uh, Turbo Graphics entry. Um, 
I remember reading or listening to Retronauts um, podcast about it. They said it sold almost one to one with Unit. So uh, there's a lot of copies of it, but it's still not exactly cheap to get. It's. I mean, I would assume it's because not to the common consumer, not a lot of people know about the Turbo Graphics or the Turbo CD. Mm-hmm. So the the demand for it is pretty low. And so it, it wasn't very popular to or begin sorry, with. The de- yeah, that's a shame. But so they had they released 29 games total from what it seems like you said there's a couple others that they that we that you can't quite remember but it seems like looking from your list here a lot of it was just either shooters or rpgs a handful of strategy games too Mm -hmm. so since you have more experience with this than i do and part of this part of me inviting you on is like wanting to learn about some of these games because they because I'm fascinated by the world of working designs, your title. Um, so I, I want to kind of learn more about it. And that's why it's been fun for me watching your videos. And you've done two so far, and you've covered Parasol Stars and Kadash, correct? Mm-hmm. And the, basically the general intro to the company was the first one. Yep. And then Cosmic Fantasy will be your next one. I'm looking forward to the rest of these. So but what are some highlights throughout all these? What are some games that stand out to you? And I'm going to probably be looking up some pictures of these as we talk about them because I'm excited. Sure. Um, So they're probably their their most their most well known games, the Lunar games for the Sega CD and remade for the PS1. They're just excellent RPGs, great stories, great music, great sense of humor and character. They're all really well done with good art and a battle system that's kind of unique. It's kind of a precursor to Grandia almost, where placement on the field and they move around as they attack. So you got to keep that in mind. It's pretty interesting. And um, they're crowd favorites. I think even if people don't know working designs, if they know like the PS one era or Sega seed era games, they know Lunar Mm -hmm. and um, popful mail is a popular game too, for the Sega CD. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a Falcom game. It's kind of like a sister series to yeast almost. Okay. Yeast games. Um, it was it's a bunch of different versions of it, but that one is probably the best one. I did see there was a Popful Mail when I googled it. There was like Popful Mail SNES. Did it also get a Super Nintendo release? There's like a different version of that game for like every platform at the time, and each one's a little different. That's so. That's such a weird thing. That's such a '90s thing where you would yeah. release the same game on multiple multiple systems, but they're different. The most obvious example is like the Aladdin game for the SNES for and the Genesis, where they're just vastly different games yeah i know what you mean um because on the japanese pc and the pc engine turbo graphics version of pop mail it's like a side scrolling yeast automatic attacks okay. and everything and on the sega cd you gotta use manual attacks by tapping the button and moving around and i think that's huh. the best version of the game is the one that working designs brought over and that's the one for the sega cd yeah and um okay. some other ones that stand out i guess are Dragon Force for the Saturn, which is a really cool real-time strategy game where you control entire armies of 2D sprites on a 3D plane. It's a real-time strategy game? I think it's real-time. It's, it's, it's kind of kind of real-time, kind of not. It's um, But there's like hundreds of sprites battling over each other on this massive field at the same time. It's really fun. Wow. I'm looking at some like screenshots of it, and like these are big sprites, too. Some yeah. Of these, some of these things are huge. And it, it, the camera, from what I can see, is that it looks like it's, I mean, this angle specifically looks like a fighting game, but with but with armies versus just one-on-one characters. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's pretty unique, too. It's one of the games that you look at and you're like, why the hell didn't Sega do this themselves? Because it's such a cool idea. I wonder, though, if because strategy games on consoles weren't quite as big as they were on home, That's true. on home computers, you know? Yeah. Like, not in the 90s were the decade of the RT, well, the golden decade for RTS games, because that's when you had Warcraft and Starcraft and Age of M. I think the first Age of Empires came out in the in the 90s. I think so. Uh, and uh, Command and Conquer and all that stuff. So I feel like that the, they that had its market there. And home consoles, there's a... No, I 
I was thinking about this literally the other night and I'm saying it on the podcast now. So maybe it'll, this will hold myself. I'll hold myself accountable <laughs> now that I've put this out into the universe, but I've been wanting to do a series on the show of the history of RTS games and not even necessarily pure RTS. Like what are some of the origins of RTS like North and South on the NES kind of mm. has some RTS roots. Um, there's a game I randomly got for the Genesis and I am forgetting what it's called. I'm, Oh, Tyrants Through Time. It's a weird game for the Sega Genesis that like I don't quite understand. Let me see if I can double check if I have the name correct. It's Fight Through Time Tyrants. That's what it's called. Hmm. Fight Through Time Tyrants. And it is just this. It's like a Sega Genesis RTS strategy game. And it's very, it's fascinating to me. The picture, like the box art, is wild too i'm gonna send you a link of it (laughs) okay because it's one of the weirdest things it's got a caveman running from airplanes and tanks that sounds cool (laughs) it's one of the strangest things but yeah dragon force is a cool game and then they also did a magic knight rare for the saturn which was one of the first games released for it and um one of the last, it's the last game released in the US because of all the work they had to do to make that game work. Oh, Magic Knight Rare. Okay. I thought yeah. you said Imagine Rare. Imagine oh, Knight Rare. That's one of your favorite games, right? I really like it because I like Zelda likes that are kind of RPG, but not super RPG heavy. Mm-hmm. And Rare is just a really pretty game and it's got a lot of charm and it's got a lot of attitude to it and not in like a 90s, like radical attitude, but like personality that I like. Mm-hmm. And I like the manga and the anime that's based off of as well. And that helps. What, what's the anime called? Is it the, of the it's same Magic name? Night Rare. Yeah. I will have to check this out. Is there an easy way to play this game now uh, no. without having to spend an arm and a leg? <laughs> you could emulate it. I could probably offline give you some tips to emulate stuff. I might, I might have to check that out. I mean, I know for those listening, I know the emulation arguments always up in the air, but unless, how much, is, how much is Magic Knight Ray Earth right now? Over like a thousand dollars new. Yeah, no, I don't have a not even new. I need a house. I need a house at some (laughs) point, so I can't really. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's insane. It's the last Saturn game release, which brings up the price a lot, and it's also a working designs game, which unfortunately automatically also brings the price up a lot. So it's kind of impossible. That's and you have a copy though, right? I had a copy uh, years and years ago, and I sold it when I had to move. I was I I totally for some reason I thought on your Twitter I could have sworn I saw you had a copy of it maybe oh, I, was I, just... I have a repro case for it and I have a oh, creatively okay. acquired copy let's just say <laughs> that's a good way to put it okay <laughs> uh, what are some other highlights that you, that we should touch on though um, let me take a look at the list real quick again some ones that are interesting maybe for a controversial standpoint is a silhouette mirage they made a lot of structural changes to that game um how it plays to make it harder for the rental market at the time Uh uh-huh that that old that age old argument and also because i guess at the time game stores are doing a special where like if you beat this if you have it return it within like a week or so you can you can exchange it for any reason and get a new game and that game is short so like we got to do something else we got to be making a free rental market with great retail stores Wow. And um, they made it like twice as hard. So it's, it's still a good game, but it's some weird changes to it that really never really, I think, made for its benefit. Now, before we move on with some of these, just because uh, kind of tying into what you just said to some of the previous games, are there any other games that we've talked about already that they made some of those questionable localization choices? Um, usually they made the tweet things to make them harder or simpler in some ways. Um. Magic Knight Ray Earth, actually, they, they kind of spiced up the dialogue a little bit with some weird observations the characters make and like comments. Are you on talking the world about sexual them. comments? What are, they, are you talking about sexual comments? Do they, they make me? They make because I feel like that's a very like Japanese thing. <laughs> well, no, not really, because it's a pretty tame show. It's a shoujo manga. It's okay. a girl's manga, but um. Like this one scene, if you inspect a cabinet, one of the girls goes, wow, there's condoms in here. It's like, why is this in this game? Why would you put that in this game? And like this little quirks that they they added kind of like analogs, like um, for dubs and subs, they kind of make like say a reference doesn't make sense. We don't know the reference in English. 
they'll substitute it with a reference that's similar, like um, FLCL. Hmm. Do you know the anime? Yeah, I I think I watched it all once, but it's been it's, it's been a while. It's, it's a kind while. of a weird show, but things like they talk about expired uh, discontinued soft drinks in Japan. We won't know what they are, so they made it Crystal Pepsi in the U.S. So we know the same idea. Okay. They they did a lot of stuff like that, but some of the choices they made in that game are questionable. Like, why is this here? Why do they go that route? Okay. And so condoms was one of the ones they they decided to use. I'm pretty sure it's that game. I could be mistaken, but there's just some weird comments in that game. That is that is weird because knowing knowing. shoujo shoujo manga isn't it the girls probably like really young too it's like um girls like magical girl stuff yeah uh so that's yeah it's a little awkward i guess Mm -hmm. um okay so what uh what are some other highlights and then also as we continue through some of these highlights if there's any more of these questionable uh localization choices we could go into that too sure there's actually some in uh, Cosmic Fantasy 2, because that's what I'm playing right now. Um, they were kind of just getting their stride with localization at that point, I think. There's a reference to an old shampoo commercial when you visit a magic spring. It's, just, it's like, shampoo, take me away. And it's like, why is this here? <laughs> if you're not an American in that time period, you're not going to know what they're talking about. Well, even if you're not growing up in that yeah. time, like, you know, like you just said, like, especially like if I don't if I've never seen that commercial, I won't know what they're talking about and just be confused by the reference. I had to look it up. <laughs> so I was like, what is this reference? <laughs> and I looked it up I'm like, oh, I get it. It's a, it's the reference to a commercial from 1992 and I'm not in 1992, so I don't get it. It's kind of like um, the a lot of those parody movies after like they're, they're, you can do good parody movies and you can do bad parody, mo- mm-hmm. parody movies and the parody movies in the early 2000s, early to mid two thousands were awful. Yeah. And it was all just with really, uh, pr- uh, current jokes. Really. I forget the actual like fancy $10 word for that, but they, but it was all jokes that only people at the time would know. And if you don't have any frame of reference for it 10 years later, it's not that joke's not going to land. Yeah, it's not airplay and they're pretty bad. Yes, it's not uh, the Zucker brothers or the well, I think not the or the, the Zucker. The Zuckers yeah, did so. did airplane. And then, of course, Mel Brooks, the, yeah. the champ of parodies. Um, I was even oh, I totally was thinking about what I meant to bring to talk about this when you brought it up before, but the whole difficulty spike in some of these like that's such a it's it's an interesting perception that people always say, you know, games in Japan were, are harder than they are in the States. And that's not necessarily true. You know, right. That's like, true. Yeah. Um, it, some the other shooters here, and stuff. They did that like uh, I think it's Ray Crisis or Ray Storm. I forget which one there. They have similar names. So I get them confused, but. Like the amount of health, how many hits you can take, they changed up a little bit, and so it's a little bit harder. And also, some games like Alundra, which is one of their better games, I was going to mention too for the PS1. It's a really good game, won a lot of awards. They made it a little more tricky, like your your life gets hit harder, and there aren't as many restore items. But at the same time, they did things for that game, like they fixed puzzles, or they fixed menus, so they're easier to read. They did a lot of balancing on both ends of the spectrum. And I see in your notes here that it won the best RPG at E3 from Sony. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy to think about some of the things that they would change to to combat the rental market, which I mean, I don't think games really destroyed Blockbuster, but it is it is a funny thing. Nintendo, I know this isn't Nintendo, but Nintendo's always had a strange war against the rental market in the US. Yeah. Um, it's it's always so bizarre to me because that's how you know I found out about a ton of games through through that. But it's it uh, specifically I think I've referenced it before. The Adventures of Bayou Billy on the NES is stupid hard in the American release, mm-hmm. and it's ten, significantly easier in the Japanese version. A lot of and, games are like that for that for specific types of games. I feel. And but people always reference Mega Man Two as being the reason why games were harder in Japan because we had an easy mode. Uh, and norm a normal mode was there or hard. Sorry, we had a normal and hard mode, and hard mode was just their o- the only mode in Japan. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. And even like, I feel like the whole rental market's complicated. I think in Japan for a long time they couldn't do game rentals. I think it was like against the rules. 
Yep, you Some, couldn't do like that. it was illegal. Yeah, exactly. It was illegal. But you could do music rentals, I think. It's a weird it's a weird decision for sure. And I remember the first time so I, I used to work at a library and we could you could rent CDs there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, What you can just rent CDs? Like who does who rents CDs? That's so weird. But because I would never see it at Blockbuster, it was just completely off of my radar. So the idea of renting CDs just seemed so foreign to me. Uh yeah. But a fun fact i would actually rip those cds and get a lot of free music that way if the library yeah, one way to it, do it it's i found out it's completely legal because yeah, cool. it's just the peer-to-peer sharing stuff is where it gets sketchy for for everybody but um not good for your computer either really <laughs> yes <laughs> thank god i uh, i didn't have good internet in the late 90s early 2000s so i didn't really have to deal with the with the viruses from LimeWire mm-hmm. or or uh, Napster or anything like that. You're not missing uh, out. <laughs> <laughs> the entire month of May here on Still Loading has been sponsored by Geek Guilt. Geek Guilt is the go-to shop for all of your geeky needs. You know I'm a retro gamer and I personally love their selection of NES games. And right now, they have a deal going on where if you buy a pair of headphones and a mod mic, you will get a discount on both of them. So go to geekguilt.com and check out everything they have to offer. Uh, but all right, so what are some other games that we should dive into? Um, well, everybody has their favorites, so it's hard to say exactly, but I think Ark the Lad is one I really started playing for the first time recently because it's a trilogy of games plus a side game in one package. It's a lot of content, and um, they're all good. They're strategy RPGs, and they're really famous in Japan, but they didn't make a splash in the U.S., and they released them like three or four years after they came out in Japan. I see it's a really late PS1 release as well. Yeah. It came out in 2002. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first one came out in 96, I think, and then 97 and 99, I think, something like that. So wow. they wouldn't, they didn't get permission to bring them over until all of them were out in Japan. It was wow. a weird, another weird rights situation. The the whole thing, it, it just it boggles my mind. I mean, I'm not surprised they had such a hard time bringing some of these games over, basically because of the time, like the mm-hmm. exact, you know, the 90s and early 2000s were not kind to uh japan to heavy japanese style games yeah uh so it's interesting because you know in the 80s and you know early 90s it was all japan because that's all we there wasn't a lot of western developers and then as the ps1 and ps2 came out a lot more western developers got into it and it was hard to sell more japanese style games in the u.s so the niche generally got more skewed for sure the what? Sorry, it got more niche and stuff like how mm. how things have, were developed. It's kind of a random question, but have you ever played the Atelier Iris games? Atelier games. I have one of them, but I haven't played it yet. So I've I've only I did I did an episode on it like years ago. I eventually want to redo it because I've never actually played the games, mm-hmm. but it's uh it's got this gorgeous like two D sprite and stuff like that. It's it's when it's on the PS two, but it, my brother. Like he adores it. it. He he loves it. And it's funny because he doesn't really play a lot of other games except for these heavy JRPGs. Like, and he found out later on though the Atelier series is more of like a an item RPG. You know, like uh, where it's all like alchemy and you're mixing yeah, I've heard different uh, potions and uh, things together. So it's not really like a, a fine like. What he played it was the games he played were more Final Fantasy esque, mm-hmm. and then the Atelier games later on that he played were just all more. It's basically just a menu game. <laughs> Everything's in menus, just mixing potions and stuff like that. But all right, uh, what uh, what are some other games you want to touch on? Um, those are the big ones for me that I've been playing right now. And I said the Growlancer games because they're really cool strategy games, and they got a lot of really nice art. And it was kind of the nail in the coffin for them. So it's a neat. It's a neat. Um, one to go out on because they give a really cool special edition for that game. It's got tons of stuff with it. And that's something they did with a lot of their games. They had really good packaging and bonus extras and stuff. It almost seems like they were like the proto uh, limited run games. <laughs> yeah, they like Exceed or Atlas with their special editions. They did a lot of the similar stuff to that. OK, OK. Here, I can send you a picture of the special edition thing. Yeah, you can see that. it comes with a watch, a deck of cards. 
comes with, yeah, it comes with so much cool stuff. It comes with a watch, a soundtrack, a deck of cards, a necklace, and a ring. What? Yeah. What? Hold that's on. Ins- that's so much. Yeah. That's so cool, though. If you just Google Growlancer Generations, it's one of the first pictures in the first row. Oh, I see it. I see yeah. it. Wow. That is... You know what? You're right. What a way to go out. And it came out over like two and a half years after their over two and a half years after their previous release. Cause Ark the lad was their Ark the lad collection came out in Oh two, like yeah. April of Oh two. And growl answer was December of 2004. They had other games they were trying to push out too, but they just had the same re- like reaction from Sony where like, um, you know, the Goemon series, are you familiar with those games? I am, but I know nothing about them. I just I've heard the name and I've seen uh, mystical. I've seen pictures of mystical yeah. ninja Goemon. Well, they did a prequel game for the PS2, and Working Designs fell in love with it. They really wanted to publish it, but because it was an early PS2 game, it, the graphics weren't quite there, so they were denying the game for release after they started work on it. And it was like, so the translation is done somewhere in someone's basement. They just can't release it. That's insane. Yeah, it's that's so shame. wild to me. Like what likes it? Like, I just i I wonder if I wonder if they still have any like those legal documents and they could like donate them to the Game History Foundation because that would be that'd be like, really cool. really interesting, right? Like, how yeah. cool would that be to have that preserved so that way people can know like either the bullshit that they went through <laughs> or the bullshit they were spewing? I don't think I don't. I'm not going to, I don't think they would be spewing anything because they're just trying to get these RPGs like these, these, you know, these niche games out to audiences that were probably clamoring for them at the time. Cause yeah, you, well, like within their audience, they sold pretty well. I believe it. I believe it. One that sticks out to me on here is the Sega ages one. I think that's kind of cool oh, that, yeah. they, that they brought over uh, a, a compilation game for the Saturn and it's got space Harrier from what I see in your notes, mm-hmm. space Harrier Afterburner two outrun. Yeah. It's all three of those in one package. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. I, I, I always was fascinated by the early compilations of like consoles. Like, you know, you think of Super Mario All-Stars and how it had Super Mario Bros. 1 through 3 and the actual the actual Super Mario Bros. 2, the Lost Levels. Yeah. Then, you know, Namco does the Namco Museum, but they actually like treated it like a museum. Like you mm-hmm. could go around and explore and play some of the games or play the games and also look at production art and stuff from like that's really freaking cool that that was on a ps1 too like who would have thought they would have cared that much yeah i, I, think I they wish did more the, devs would do that they did the sick ages in 97 for the saturn that was a pretty good time too but like those those three arcade games are really good games i have just thinking of those arcade games i i can show you after we're done recording if if i remember where i put oh there it is actually <laughs> i have a book which is and the a Sega arcade pop-up book where when you open it up, it's the arcade cabinet, but as a pop-up. And you oh, that's cool. Just open. Yeah, it, it was, I, I found it through a guy on Twitter named Mike Micah and it, it, it's, it's a little expensive of a book. It's like 60, 70 bucks, but it's like a, I don't think 70, but it's like you open it up and they have like five or six different cabinets that just these beautiful pop-up versions of them. And it's really, it's really fun to look at. Neat. Anyway, so, I think just what's interesting about working designs, like, well, we kind of talked about a lot of the games here. Now I want to kind of talk about the legacy of the, of them. Oh, sure. Because I can't think of another publisher that really gave this much attention and care to niche titles, especially at the time. Like now you have, uh, now that limited run games is so popular, there are so many limited run esque business, Mm -hmm. business models out there. I mean, I've seen so many, super rare games is one there's so many and it feels like it honestly feels like working designs was kind of a proto limited run super yeah, rare games and all that, stuff. that they they kind of remind me of atlas and exceed uh, as other publishers because they mm-hmm. they bring out a lot of japanese style games that have that flavor that really wouldn't really even think to bring out in the u.s like the disgaea games and the printy games for the psp and stuff like that Mm-hmm. Some of those RPGs, like I think our Tonelico and the Atelier series, those kind of games wouldn't have come out here. if I think work, working designs hadn't proven that that kind of formula could work in the first place. 
they kind I of agree. set the stage that like, oh, these niche titles have a fan base and they can be sold here. And what an aggressive move, right? Like you, you, your their first game came Parasol Stars was released in ninety one. So ninety one was not that far removed from like the the Japanese scare of the, of the eighties and nineties when a lot of like less open minded Americans will <laughs> say that as that nicely were just terrified that Japan was going to take over the U S because their economy was booming at the time. So like what a gutsy move for them to put out extremely Japanese games yeah. at a time that was probably not the most friendly to very Japanese things. And like a lot of their best early games are really story heavy or cutscene heavy. And that really wasn't a thing in the West, especially, especially on at, console. at the time. Yeah. Especially on consoles. Like, Cosmic Fantasy 2 has like 35 minutes of cutscenes. They're all short and they're kind of limited in animation, but they're really impressive for the time. I did a stream forever ago on Twitch where I used to do this thing called Sega Saturday where I would play some of my Sega consoles Mm -hmm. and I I had a nice upscaler so it looked really crisp. Uh, I was borrowing it from a friend though. I I couldn't afford one at the the moment. But uh, I was playing uh, Lunar. I was playing Lunar and I was showing like Look at this. This is on a game from 19. What when did Lunar One come out? 93 it was yeah. published. So I would assume like at least two years prior, one to two years prior in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh it was out there. But like and it, you know, like you said, limited animation. I was just like, look at this. Like that's insane that this exists. When you when you this type after of this, you should look at the Lunar 2 cutscenes. They're beautiful. They're really fluid and really impressive. Even on the Sega CD? Yeah, they're really something to look at. Maybe I'll find a copy of Lunar 2 then. Uh, so every year my work gives us a hundred, like our bonus, because I'm not <laughs> salary. Our bonus is a hundred dollar American Express gift card. Okay. That we, which is nice because it's just a hundred dollars we can use anywhere. But it's so I, I use what I usually do is I take that gift card and then I will go to my local game store. And I will spend all of it because <laughs> it's that's the only time I can really afford to drop like a hundred dollars on a game mm-hmm. you know what i yeah. mean yeah you know what i should do i should totally be like i should pick like a like a uh something i this is me just thinking out loud right now and i'll probably I'm, i'll probably leave it in the episode <laughs> um i'll pick like a big ticket item there one time that like i'm talking like a lot of money that he, they weren't able to move and i'll just just drop a hundred dollars on it every year <laughs> until it's paid off and then i can take it <laughs> like if if he's willing to lay away lay it away from me you should try a first i've noticed recently because i I collect stuff still is um facebook groups for selling stuff is sometimes a lot more cost effective and better condition than ebay and stuff really yeah i found really? um a saturn working designs game recently but it's, it's missing the back cover but i got it for like a third of the price of a full condition one on ebay well, if you don't mind me asking, what was the price you got it for? I don't want to say right now. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> it was more than I thought. I, I ended up had I had some money left over from something, and I sold a couple older games to make okay, up for okay. it. Okay, but I was like, eh, I don't get it. Okay, um, and they also just the fact that they really went for a lot of uh shooters when the shooters were pretty much dying too. Yeah, in, in they, the, in the they West, did some really say. good ones too, like the Ray Crisis, Ray Storm, um. Sylphie for the PS2, or they're all really fun. Is Sylphie Sylphie is that expensive? I feel like that's probably not that um, much. Sylphie and Gun Griffin are probably their least expensive games right now. I'm gonna actually go to price charting and see what the average is right now because I'm curious. Or they were a couple um, of years ago, at least. I'm not sure right now. Sylphie Lost Planet. Yeah, it's not. It's it's extremely affordable right now. For the PS2, a loose copy of it is thirteen seventy, and then a complete oh, cool. is twenty. It's that's like good, twenty yeah. bucks. And so um, that's, that's for self feed. That's I'd one be of the games, What was the other one you mentioned? Um, Gun Griffin. Gun Griffin. Okay. Let's see what that. Gun one Griffin is. Blaze. Yeah. Oh my god, that's even cheaper. Ten bucks CIB. Yeah. They're not my favorites of their releases, but they're still good games. And um, that's an example of like. They tried to improve their games too among just localizations. Like, Sylphie didn't have analog control. They added analog control and rumble to that game. Mm-hmm. And for same thing with Art the Lad, Art the Lad didn't have analog. It didn't have rumble. The menus got in the way of the visuals. So they redid all the menus. <laughs> they got they got rid of 
some problems like with slowdown and they got, they added rumble, they added analog support. So they were really trying to make games for the better as well as twerk the localizations. I really wanted to, I, cause when I first kind of, like I said at the beginning, like I, I'm so happy I had you on for this because <laughs> working designs is just so fascinating to me. And I was hoping to try to find like, Victor Ireland or just somebody to hop like someone who worked there to hop on to be like, what was it like to work at working designs during this time? That would have been um, cool. I don't, I mean, I, I did a little bit of digging and it was kind I think I found a little bit, but the only reason that it stopped me is I honestly didn't know enough about these releases. I don't, and I don't have a lot of nostalgia for them. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by them from a historical standpoint. And also some of these games look like a lot of fun to play. I, have like I showed you off, Mike. I have a copy of Lunar the Silver Star for the Sega CD, and I do want to play it, but I always feel weird playing games in my game room because my wife and kid are downstairs. So, like, what <laughs> am I going to do? Just play an RPG for four hours by myself in the yeah, like in in my game room. But eventually, I will get to playing some of these games, and I hopefully hopefully I can find some of these awesome like Popful Mail looks really cool. Uh, obviously Lunar 2 I want to get my hands on because I have the first one. I am curious about some of these action RPGs like Exile. Uh, and Exile, Exile is really cool. Phenomenal. What what's like what is the like what's the mechanic for that one? Like what it's, are the game? It's like a hack like? and slash game where you level up and you can do spells and you can learn stuff as you go. Um, it's also on the Genesis. Okay, but a different oh, really? a different company released it, so it's a little different. Of course it is. <laughs> it's the same game, but it's a different localization, and a couple of things are removed and changed. Like, um, and the working designs, Trevor Graphics version, the teleport spell is missing, so I have to go all the way back through the level once you're done with it. Oh, which is a little oh. bit of a pain, but the the cutscenes in that game are really cool too, and the voice acting for the time is good. It's kind of cheesy now, but it's still fun. That's the other thing I was hoping I mentioned before. I was hoping to get people who worked at working designs. I want to get some of the voice actors that from would like be sweet. The, their, their CE titles. How nuts would that be? Like, I want to know. So the, the first thing that like it blew my mind when I heard it, when I popped in Lunar and the first bit of voice acting you hear that isn't like the, the, the song, which I was like, okay, there's a, you know, it's C it's red book audio. It's on a CD. Mm -hmm. So you, they can play actual songs on this, but was the dragon i don't even remember the dragon's name but she's calling Null? out call it no calling yeah. out alex and it's the most obnoxious voice i've ever heard <laughs> like it's, it's almost like toad but not quite as bad and just screaming alex yeah oh, alex there's yeah, a lot more dialogue in lunar 2 as well like lunar 2 and popful mail there's like way more dialogue than you'd ever think they could fit on that little cd it's it blows my mind what this, some like what they're able to do with some of this stuff. Yeah, this just thinking of like this is a tangent. So apologize to listeners, but I, I love it, you know it's me. Um, <laughs> there, I'm always blown away when games can do like game devs can do crazy good compression. Like mm -hmm. if you look at games like Super Mario 64, it blows my mind that they could fit that thing on a on an N64 cartridge because the N64 cartridge couldn't fit that much data. Oh yeah. Same with Resident Evil 2 on that system. It's like how the hell they do that? Craft is what it is. <laughs> like it's the only, only logical explanation. And it, I mean even if you look at even modern Nintendo stuff, right? Like Breath of the Wild is a massive game and you can they can fit that on on one disc on the Wii U or one cartridge on the Switch. Meanwhile, I'm playing Red Dead Redemption 2 and that has requires an install disc for the PS2 and then another and then a play disc. Like there's huh. so much data. I forget how how large that file size is, but it's pretty it's pretty damn big. Hmm. But anyway, um, OK, so before we wrap this all up, are there any final thoughts on working designs? Like, is there anything you would like to say about it that I didn't ask you or that I that I kind of neglected? Um, people I think a lot of times recently they look at the at the games through a lens of how things are done today and how we know about localization today. And they're like, oh, they changed too much or this, these changes don't make sense or it's too, subs for subs too argument, li liberal, yeah. not enough literal. This whole sub versus dub debate and how you approach localization. But I think it's important to realize when you look back at these games, you want to try them that no one was doing anything like this. It was very new. It was very approachable and it made a lot of sense compared to the contemporaries 
Yeah. So if we do want to try like Popful Mail, Exile, uh, Lunar One or Two, or any of those, especially their older games, you got to keep in mind that like th- for the time, it's really spectacular. Even even today, it's very approachable. You can jump into those games and understand and feel for the characters like that. There's no awkwardness to it really from a American or Western standpoint. Yeah. And that's still hard to do, I think, in regards to localization even today. I get what you're saying with that, because I've kind of run into a wall recently with my love of JRPGs, where modern JRPGs, and I, I feel awful saying this because it's, it, it, I, I, try, I, don't, I feel like I shouldn't feel this way. It's almost too Japanese for me, not because I dislike Japanese, but it's just it's it's out of my not comfort zone, but it's like I don't have as much to relate to. So when you can't it identify far, with it. Yeah, it's harder for me to identify with. And I don't like that because there's a lot of great games out there that I really feel like I'm missing. And not not all JRPs, obviously. Like I, I, I've i played some of the Persona games, never mm-hmm. beat any of them, but I've played a couple of Persona games. Those are super fun and I, I relate to the characters and they're good. Um, And obviously the Final Fantasies, I still love those, even though I don't play them as much as I used to. But like, um, but like a lot, some of my favorite RPGs are older ones. JRPGs are older ones because they had to do a little bit more localization. I shouldn't say a little bit more, but they were definitely more focused on trying to make it palatable to the Western audience. I understand and, what you mean. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. And there's some great games that, that uh, are very Japanese. Like, I, would you say Earthbound is a pretty Japanese feeling game? I'd say Earthbound is a pretty. It's like if a, pa- a person Japanese from Japan has never been to America, Western. views America. Yeah. 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 That was a bad example. I, think, I know what but, you mean, though. I uh, just, but like, for example, like the Italian games, like I mentioned before, that's, I can't get into those. Like, I, the whole RPG, I mean, and maybe it's just the battle system, too. Maybe it's not even like it's, maybe it's not how Japanese something is and that I can't relate to it. Maybe it's just simply that it, the, the, the battle systems now are just not something I connect with anymore. I like the simplistic battle systems of the 16 and 32 bit. I feel that way about some games like Pokemon. There's so, there's so much stuff in Pokemon outside of the actual battling. I'm like, I don't want to spend 20 minutes giving you profits and petting you. I want to just fight through this game. <laughs> no, I just want to use you to fight other. You. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I do. As far as I'm considered, anything past the original 150 can go away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, so that should wrap it up for this. Mike, seriously, thank you so much, man. This was a lot of fun. I know it was kind of like, uh, I was, hopefully I did an okay job listeners of kind of con- like steering the conversation here, but I, didn't know a lot. So I was really trying to uh, figure kind of figure this out as I went along. But I, I, I actually had a really good time. And I really I have a drive now to go play some of these RPGs if I can find a way to totally not emulate them. That's um, awesome. So I'm going to definitely check some of these out. But before we do final before we say goodbye, where can the good people find you online? And is there anything you would like to plug? Obviously, your forever loading channel on yeah. YouTube. Um. You can find me on Twitter at um, MikeKeke352. It's M-I-K-E-K-E-352. Um, and on YouTube as Forever Loading. It's my channel. I have two videos on working designs up now. One on the general introduction to the company and why they're special. And I do some comparisons there too to like, I, I share some really bad dubs and localizations comparing to them how they did pretty well in their own stuff. And I started, I have another video on like you said, Paracel Stars and Kadash. It's their first two games. And I should have one on um, Cosmic Fantasy 2 up in like a month, maybe. So then that might be out by the time that this episode releases, because this will be out on May 16th. We're recording this in April, but this will be out in about a month or so. That'd be cool, Hopefully. yeah. Fingers crossed as long as everything <laughs> yeah. works out. But uh, is there anything else you'd like to plug, though, before we wrap up? Um, No, I think that's about it. All right. As usual, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Still Loading Pod on all of them. If you want to support the show, please give it a five star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcasting app you use. Seriously, that honestly helps the most. That will help more people find the show. So if you have some time, just a moment of your time, please do that. You can also support the show financially, still loading or patreon.com slash still loading pod. Even just a dollar a month will help grow the show. And then the most important shout out I have is the Bit by Bit Foundation. The Bit by Bit Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to put video games and video game consoles in the hands of children receiving inpatient care at, at hospitals and children's hospitals. So if you want to donate and support them, go to bitbybitfoundation.org and check them out. 
and that will do it for this week. That is uh, a little overview of the world of working designs. And hopefully you will all go check out Mike's video series because he goes into a lot more depth on the individual games. And am I correct? You're planning on doing all these, like going through all the games in the working designs catalog at some point? Um, as many as I can. I might not go in complete order. Um, just what I have my hands on right now, you know, and what I can play the best of. Um, but at least I'm going to finish the the Turbo Graphics games in order by the end of the year, probably. All right. So, yeah, check out his stuff. And that will do it for this week. So thank you all once again for listening. Mike, thank you once again for joining me. Thanks for having me. And I will see you all next time. Peaceful.